these wood prints are essentially taking aim and clowning on these people. And they're like, oh, cool. You're a postman. Have fun slinging your ball sack post office bag over your shoulder. Oh, you're a drummer in a Western style band. How about you drum on these nuts? <laughs> out to get me you know today we're going through a real one <laughs> hello everybody <laughs> welcome to 500 open tabs i'm kava taharian and i'm hannah hillam and i'm okay <laughs> <laughs> i'm doing great <laughs> we're doing great it's a wonderful day it's starting to get hot so we decided to start recording oh. as soon as possible before we sweat to death with these yeah. earmuffs on our ears this is the thing that we have to go through to make sure that you people out there in the audience get to have the best podcast possible that and like hours of research but yes this, this so is much like yeah. it's just endless research but i good thing i like it yes uh, i'm excited to get to your part two of your uh episode from last week but before we get into it real quick we're yeah. just going to say at the top of the show, I believe this is going to come out in July, I believe this episode. So we are a couple yeah. of weeks away from Comic-Con from San Diego. Yeah. We can probably announce at this point, although at the time of the recording, I don't know if we're supposed to, but but hopefully by the time this comes out, this is okay and we won't get in trouble. But we do have a panel. panel. We have some excellent guests that are coming. It's going to be on Saturday at 1 p.m. in 28 DE. Again, hopefully that does not change. Yeah. Uh, by the time this comes out. And if it does, you're just going to see something where like I'm saying one thing and then I'll have like a voiceover on my mouth, like changing the actual letter where it's like, actually, it's at one for you on Monday morning. Blah, 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 blah. And it's got like different recording quality. Yes. Uh, yeah. But just so you guys know, if you're in San Diego, please come to the panel. It's called Escaping the Algorithm. Mm -hmm. It's about trying to find ways to build community outside the uh, traditional big platforms. We're very excited. We have some fantastic guests. Why don't you tell them who we got? Uh, so far, we have uh, nobody. Apparently, I go we got Blake. nobody. We got Lindsay oh, Ellis. We got we Patrick Lindsay. Palisteros. We got we got we Lindsay got, Ellis. Uh, we got Daisy. I don't know if she, what their last name is, but it's I think it's Noemi, right? Noemi. Okay, yeah, from LA Zine Fest, I believe is LA the, Zine uh, Fest, the organization yep. that they're in charge of. They're a photographer and organizer of Zine Fests and do-it-yourself art stuff in LA. And, Our friend uh, over in uh, Artist Alley, Patrick Ballestero. So he's going to be yeah. there. He's awesome, very talented, always has these fantastic pieces that sell out immediately. Uh -huh. uh, very and then we talented. have one more guest that is con basically confirmed, we'll but not super confirmed. We'll see, TBD, but there'll be another person there. And of course, the two of us. Yeah. Oh, well, Unfortunately yeah. for you guys. Yeah. Here's the thing you don't know yet is I'm not going to go. <laughs> 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 I'm going <laughs> to. That was a joke. I'm coming. Yeah, she'll be there. She'll be at Artist Alley right next to me, which also one more announcement. We are going to be doing a scavenger hunt oh, yeah. uh, related to the podcast, which fans that we do not have right now, but the design will be finalized. We're going to be handing out these fans as we always do, or I should say as I always do, because it's my fans tradition to, to bring stuff. Yeah, to cool people off when you're out in line waiting for whatever activation you're going to be a part of. But on these fans, there will be a series of s 10 things that you need to take pictures of yeah, that are all related 10. to the podcast. Um, again, there'll be more information about that on our social media as we get closer to the date. But keep an eye out for those two things, the panel and the fans. Without further ado, though, Hannah, why don't you tell us part two and conclude the story? Yeah. So if you remember last week, I don't, I, um, <laughs> you know, I wasn't really talking to you because I already knew the answer. <laughs> um, I was talking to the, the people, you know, the people so, for you, the great Kavik, populist. <laughs> All 12 people who listen. Just kidding. There's actually like 130 of you on the Discord. Oh, that's another Dude. thing I wanted to talk oh, yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The okay, Discord. Yeah, <laughs> Dude, the other night, we're suddenly somebody. Was it Nico or was it? Oh, Who's the no. first person? Which I don't know Daisy. which specific. No, not Daisy. Grace. Grace was Grace. like, hey, I'm trying to figure out Miles' song right, that he right, sang right, right. for you guys on the accordion. And she posts this video of herself playing the song on the accordion. And then another person comes in. I believe it's jazz. Yeah, she plays a, a song on the ukulele. On the ukulele. And suddenly everyone's posting videos of them Nico playing the And then Nico comes in with like the piano riff yes. that he's just playing. I kind of wanted to take them all into an editing software and lay them oh, on top sure. of each other. But yeah, uh, warmed our hearts. Warmed our oh, hearts. It like warmed my heart to the point where I was uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, with how good it made me feel, you know what I mean? Yeah, I was like, you like yeah. me? Why? Yeah, I was like, oh, I will disappoint stop. you. <laughs> Don't invest in this. <laughs> but 
but also please invest in this. Go to our Patreon and give us, you know, some money. Money. And join the money, Discord. Please. Anyway, yes. Pro okay. Thank you for remembering to do the shout yeah. out. But go ahead. To catch you up, because yes. I think you'll you'll need it most, is last week I told the beginning of the story of the great heist of 1303, mm -hmm. which was, uh, it, it started with Edward Longshanks, you know, guy you know right, from right, right. Braveheart. Braveheart, yeah. He's waging war against the Scots. He's left a skeleton crew in London to keep things running. Many of them were monks and clerks. And I want right. to say cl clerks aren't necessarily religious secretaries. They're just kind of like in general secretaries. I made okay. a mistake. He also, he left 100,000 pounds, like the currency pounds, worth yeah. of treasure in London and took the rest of it up north so he could pay for his war because he loves killing uh, and depressing. <laughs> and um, the Scots hate him. And so do the Welsh. Anyway. And so does Mel Gibson. And Mel, Mel Gibson, yeah, that's why just he killed him. He hates this man. He's just he like, I'm going to murder you. Right. He wanted <laughs> the English, to. The English famously won. He got killed won. by Mel Gibson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The English famously won that battle. Uh, so anyway, he split up this treasure among a few areas around the country. And one of these areas was a section of Westminster Abbey known as the Chapter mm -hmm. House. And it right. was like a meeting room for monks. And directly below it was what was known as the Picks chamber pix chamber pix chamber okay p y x which is like a latin word for like little treasure boxes pikes pikes you're like pikes, pikes chamber pix so, chamber that's our set setting uh our okay. main guy wool merchant and former clerk of westminster abbey that i had just mentioned richard right. of pudlycott is pissed what off did I call at the him? king dick puddle is that i call dick them puddles. dick puddle cock is what i called them last D week dick puddle cock. <laughs> oh no okay that's right dick puddle cock so yes dick now puddle cock is in <laughs> this em embittered man he hates the king so much because the king rose taxes on his wool industry and i found out right, I was, right. yes 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 I, was, I remember now over last week i was like i don't know how he escaped from that belgian prison Mm -hmm. um, he had to give them all his money in order to pay back the king's debt. So he had oh, to pay back the king's debt. He had to debt. front the money for that guy. Yes, for that guy. And what a king, dick. Oh, I'd be oh, so pissed. He was rogue with how angry he was. He was like, I don't, I, I don't have anything to lose. And so he Fully comes back justified. to- Fully justified. Right. He comes back to England and he tries to sue the king. And the king is like, I don't- like Good swats luck. him away like, like a fly. Yeah. You know, like, what do you- I'm too busy Law. murdering, murdering <laughs> yeah. Celts. Mel what? Gibson. I don't have time for yeah. this. Yeah. There's this guy up here who's absolutely insane and claims he's from yeah. a place called America. Uh, <laughs> Australia, I, I believe, actually, is where he's, he's from originally. Australian? But... You didn't know this? <laughs> I, I, I can't explain why, but that was like the final straw for me. <laughs> Like, I don't. <laughs> I like how Mel Gibson being Australian is what ruined your day. <laughs> it wasn't everything else that's happened today. It's fine <laughs> that he's Australian. I just didn't know. I just feel like I, I would have should have known. <laughs> you know. Okay, continue. I'm sorry to. I'm sorry to have just thrown I, that in there in the middle of this conversation. I don't think I can. Can hold on. I need to close my eyes to trick my body into thinking it's safe. <laughs> From Mel okay. Gibson, the Australian. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So He's tried to sue the king, but he yeah, couldn't the king, because the king is off killing Scots. Yes. Uh, he is back in London just, just mm -hmm. raging like yeah. I am right now for no... But he, he has a reason. That's the thing. He has a complete normal reason. And... <laughs> He's completely broke. He's like scrounging for jobs and money because remember, everyone's also broke because the king is right. like, I need all of your money and every industry is suffering and everyone is so pissed off at the king. So that's Richard and he's hanging out. And remember, all the Richard, uh, sorry, the king of England is gone. And so there's like way lax, like it's all lax, like, uh, no, you know, everyone you know what's kinda... funny is this reminds it's Robin Hood, essentially. It's like almost the same premise. It's you'll you'll definitely see. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Continue. Um, he is a little bit like a, just an angry Robin Hood. Yeah. 
figure. It's literally, but I mean, but I mean, that was the same thing where like the king was off yeah. on his crusade, basically taxing everybody to death so he can go with his lover, uh, the king of right. France, and then go try and kill Saracens. Oh, yeah. And then it was a weird, like, king it was, John. It was, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but it's essentially the same premise, except in that yeah. one, that was about religious war. This is about, uh, I guess, land, uh, this ethnic is about... war. I don't know what you would call it. Here's what it was. He, so Richard is, sorry, not Richard. They're all named Richard or Edward. Or, Longshanks. Or Dick. Or, you know, Eddie. Edward, King Edward the First, Longshanks. Yeah. He's rare in that he never lost any land. But he was also war hungry. So he wanted, he, he thought the Celts, because remember, they're Anglo-Norman in England. And then there's Celts in Wales and Scotland. And he mm-hmm. was like, that land is pretty good. I'd like it. Yeah. And mm, the Scots mine. and the Welsh are giving yeah. him a gigantic headache. They will not stop, like, just prodding and poking and taking little bits of land. And so he finally just, like, bam. That's why he's called the, the Hammer of the Scots. He had already mm-hmm. quelled whales, you know, took the spirit out of them. And then he was doing it to the Scots, too. So he, it was mostly yeah. like he was like, stop rebelling. Yeah. <laughs> like, fine. I'm, I'm going all out. I'm flattening you. That's the kind of war. And then he was also in France and also in the Holy Land. So it was still some religious war. And he was. Oh, um, so he was all over the place, too. I didn't realize that he had. This he had guy gone was that far. barely in England. <laughs> he, <Right>. like, <laughs> he was he was away. He was an absent s- father. He, he went out for cigarettes and never came back. <laughs> he, w- he went out to steal a bunch of holy relics and never came yeah. back. Classic. <sighs> Dad, come back. Papa was kidding. a rolling stone. <laughs> but the king was a rolling stone. <laughs> Meanwhile, so, Richard so, is angry, justifiably. Dick, Dick is angry, and he's like, and everyone's just, all these monks are drunk and kind of just doing what they want. Because, yes. again, everyone's a little pissed at the king, and there is there is like a skeleton government. So, like, there isn't overwatch. Like, there, even, there right. aren't overseers. No one's keeping track or tabs. So, these monks right. are like, we're going to get day drunk and right. uh, go hang out with sex workers at night. So... By the way, the fact that the treasure was being guarded by drunk monks just kind of blows my mind. <laughs> I, I like, if I were the king, I wouldn't leave the treasure in a church with drunk monks. I don't know. I guess at that point, that's there's a certain level of arrogance where you're like, who would dare even steal from me in the first place? That's true. They know that I'll just chop their heads off. I'll kill all of them. Yeah. Anyway, last I left off, Richard mm-hmm. had just stolen some plate, some silver plates from Westminster right. Abbey and kind of gotten right. high. He was like, yeah. that was great. And I was able to get money and pawn this. And so right. He, he went and sold it, it on eBay. a few more times. Yes. He sold it on eBay, uh, which is just at the bay. He just yeah. threw it in the ocean. <laughs> He's like, I need, here's the thing. I used to work here. I know there's way yeah. more treasure here. Mm-hmm. I need to steal that treasure because I can't keep stealing just these little bits and pieces. I need more because yeah. I'm broke. And so he runs mm-hmm. out of money around Christmas. And that's when he's like, Don't gotta assemble. Uh, right? I gotta <laughs> assemble my crew. So before we get into the the actual crew, I got to mm-hmm. lay out his original plan. Because here's the thing. Okay. We have Richard's account of this, but we don't have anybody else's account of this. Because Richard is awesome and didn't name any of his conspirators. Nice. None. He didn't say a word. And so you know why? Because only... snitches get stitches. That's why. Yeah, because he snitches He's like the stitches. Mac Dre of his time. He just would not talk. He's been betrayed by the king. He would never betray his friends. <laughs> What did you just say? It was a reference to Mac Dre. He's a very famous rapper in the East Bay. He wrote a track. It was called Don't Ask oh, Me really? Shit. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Anyway, look it up. It's East Bay. Okay. It's very famous in the East Bay of San Francisco that he didn't nice. say shit and he went to jail for it. Anyway, um, that's besides the point. Continue. Uh, okay. Yes, that's it. That's Richard. That's Dick. So yeah. Richard is like, so how am I even going to do this? If I mm-hmm. sneak in, I can't get past any of the monks because they'll see me, even though they are drunk. Uh, there's no windows or or doorways that go into this this underground place. And the only entrance into the chamber is a door that goes to the upstairs. So you have to go in through multiple areas before going down into the crypt. And it's locked. So he starts thinking, all right, I got to make a hole in the wall. That's what I got to do. And I got to start now. And so he starts planning on, I, I, I need to start chiseling a hole in this wall. And it, But then he realizes there's no cover. <laughs> there's only a gra- there's only a graveyard and he's like I can hide behind oh, right. a gravestone. Yes, that's yeah. right. There's a graveyard right up against the wall. And so right. he decides to go buy a bunch of seeds. Okay. And he covers the ground with seeds, plants a bunch of seeds, and waits for grass to grow five feet tall. Oh my god. So, yeah. How long does that take? 
great you know how weeds are grass just it was hemp i'm an apartment kid i have no idea actually no (laughs) okay okay couple couple rains and they'll get they'll get tall couple rains like a couple so it's like a few months it's not like years or anything oh no no okay um hemp grass grows pretty quickly um and so he while he this grass is growing he he goes and starts assembling his crew and so because he doesn't know anything about masonry or has no tools, he's like, I'm going to go mm-hmm. talk to my friend. And this friend's name is John of St. Albans. And this dude okay. lived in the area. He knows Richard. Richard knows him. They trust each other. And apparently he's one of the best masons around. Nice. And he goes to him and he's like, hey, John, can you give me any tips on digging through a 12-inch wall? And John's like, sure, yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> yeah. He's like, I... I'm going to steal a bunch of treasure and you can have some. So he's got John of St. Albans on board. And this guy starts giving Richard a bunch of good tools. Cool. And Richard takes three months to dig a hole through this wall. So every night he goes and hides in the grass and chisels his way a little more into this. He's literally Andy Dufresne. That's what he is. Yes. A hundred, but like the opposite way. And probably right. stay, breaking into smells, the prison instead of out of it. Yeah. He probably smells terrible because the sure. streets are full of piss and poo. So he swam through the river of shit and then broke, yes. then dug the hole in the river. Exactly. It's reverse All Andy reverse. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. While he's doing this digging for three months, he also goes around and starts to figure out who else he needs. He needs a safe house because if he gets this treasure, he's going to take it somewhere, you know? Right. You got a story. Um, and he has a friend who he's like, Maybe this guy will be into it. And this guy mm-hmm. is named William. And he is okay. the de- deputy keeper of the keys for a nearby jail. So okay. again with the jail, he, he's yeah. like, this is genius. I'll hide in a jail. No one will know. No one will notice. So he goes to William and he's like, oh, Willie. No. <laughs> I feel like this is going to go terribly wrong now. A lot of things are going to go wrong. But... Look, this is why you, if you're bl- bl- blinded with rage, don't plan a heist. Or don't have your exit strategy be to literally go into jail, I can imagine. Into a jail. This is prob- into yeah. a jail. I feel like that's yeah. the thing that you're trying to avoid. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But that's like hiding in plain sight. Literally the one place you're not supposed to go. But sure. Don't worry. He'll he'll end up in, <laughs> in a jail. So we got, we got William the jailer. Mm-hmm. And he is like, oh, I'm 100% in. For sure I'll yes. do this. He's like gung-ho. Bill and, Jails, all about it. And then Bill, Billy Jail, Billy Jails. <laughs> he's Billy, singing Piano Man yeah. as he's waiting for him to show up. <laughs> what? Yeah, beautiful imagery. We should put that in the movie <laughs> that Mel Gibson's going to be in. Um, Who is Australian. I'm not okay with that. <laughs> like, why? Did so, they just not claim him? I never heard it. Do they not care about him? I wouldn't claim him. He's insane. He was the original Mad Max. Don't forget. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Doesn't get much more Australian than that. I don't. Anyway, I don't, so Bill Jail is like he's on board. He's like, you can just get arrested after you steal all the money from <laughs> right. the king. Or he, I think it was more like, come hide it in my like area yeah. of where I live here. So That I only am the only person with the key. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, these guys were actually tight. They were friends. So sure. he trusted him a lot. Next, he was like, okay, hold on. I don't actually know how to do this. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to like, I don't know how to fence these items. I don't know how to launder money. I don't know how to. That's the big problem is when you get a big heist. Yes. Is what do you actually do with that much cash? Because everyone's because, looking for yes. it. And these things are like not like common pieces it's like here's a crown a crown i stole from a king fell off the back (laughs) of a truck like (laughs) you can't just sell it in a best buy parking lot you gotta like boil it down and like turn it into something else yeah Yeah. you can't i mean you could they people do melt crowns down but like he was like so i don't actually know how to like what do i do after and so i don't know how he meets this next guy but okay the next person he finds is kind of like a mentor because he's like, I need a, I need an old timer who's done this before. And he's somehow- old timer. You have to. The one who comes out for the last job of his career, you know, yeah. comes out of retirement. And this dude is named John Rippingdale. And these names are insane. <laughs> so- Rippingdale? Yeah. <laughs> okay. John Rippingdale. And John Rippingdale is also known as the chaplain. 
because he is known to rob churches <laughs> and that's about it. So this guy um bro shit. He he that's his forte, robbing churches. Uh, cuz churches back then were like filled with gold. Yeah. Cuz they were extorting money from people. Basically. Right, because they were stealing. <laughs> because just like Jesus, they were stealing yeah. gold from all the poor people. Uh yeah. so yeah, so there was he was this John Rippingdale, the the chaplain. He was that's around a, town. That's an awesome name. Sorry. John know, Rippingdale, right? the chaplain, is <laughs> right? chef's kiss. So, right? So there's two Johns. So I'll say the Mason and the chaplain or okay. and John Rippingdale, whatever. And this guy. <laughs> All these guys are going to need nicknames, right? You got the, you got yeah. old keys. <laughs> you got the Mason. Old keys. Old keys. John the Mason. <laughs> John the Mason and John the chaplain. And the chaplain. Oh, Charlie Chaplain. And just chaplain. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can call him the tramp because he's like a chaplain. Tra- <laughs> yeah, I'm going to call him Chet the chaplain because that is his, well, his hard-earned nickname. And yeah, this story is 700 years old and he's just- a, I a, love it. He's just a skeleton at this point, but I got to honor that skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> Why was that skeleton alive? <laughs> okay. So the That's tramp. Fine. The so tramp the- comes in as the mentor. And I don't, we don't know very much about him. Like, if you Google him, there's literally nothing. And I do want to say, before I continue, I skipped an entire part. Okay. <laughs> Let's on. go back. It's non-sequential storytelling. This is like a Tarantino movie. It's fine. Go. Great. Oh, my note was that um, this area, so I went into a ton of insane research because I am mm-hmm. have manic energy at all times. Because you, ex- so, you were just existing, that's all. This is who I am, yeah. And I read so many old dumb dumb books and not even full books just skimmed them i skimmed one called um about medieval economics that almost made me want to lobotomize myself i was like yeah and then i would read one from 1915 and one from 1944 about this this whole thing and i could not find anything besides like the vague story um i did read a ton of this book called chapters in the administrative history of medieval england part two and that wow. did bring me some. That's answers. one to wake you up. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I actually really liked it. Oh, okay. I was surprised. Riveting. Okay. And but then my personal research dried up, and so I turned to YouTube. Couldn't find anything there because I wanted to know more about its accomplices. Yeah. And finally, I turned to other podcasts. And I okay. am, I am. This next part, I'm gonna put this back at the beginning. This next part about the accomplices, a lot of it comes from their research of these other podcasts. One of them I listen to a lot, History of England. And mm-hmm. he's very, very into well-sourced research. And so I do trust mm-hmm. it. So okay. um, I don't know where they got that research. I think they must have gone to like some actual library in England. Yeah, actual know. books, like a bunch yeah. of nerds. Like a bunch of dorks. Yeah. Anyway, so we got those My three, source right? is a TikTok video. Yes, thank you. Continue. <laughs> a 14-year-old. So yeah, we got the, the three accomplices. And sadly, the rest of his accomplices are lost to history because uh... our boy refused to rat them out. But most likely, there were many others. They they think that there were some guards that were paid off uh, mm-hmm. and monks, the actual monks that lived and worked in the abbey. Because remember, nice. there are a bunch of degenerates at this point. They're drunk, yeah. And also uh, women. And here's the thing. Women are involved in almost every aspect of history, but they get erased, including crimes. And, what? Um, <laughs> Yeah, have you ever heard of women? This is the first time hearing about this. No, I know. It's some it's weird. I know you don't see them like when you're walking around and stuff. Um no. No, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh I'm talking to myself was... right now, actually. Yo, it's just you. <laughs> None of this is real. <laughs> so he also had some women of ill repute, aka sex workers, who sorry, but like for sure I'd end up doing that, right? Everyone would. <laughs> ill repute, yes. I would be do. I would immediately want to help if someone was like, "I'm going to give you money, and and you, all you have to do is help me with this." I'd be like, "Absolutely." This no is more- like a, an Agatha Christie novel where it's like it's not a matter of who did it; it's more like who didn't do this is it's, really the question. Who did not include themselves in it? Are so right because you'll see at the end how many people okay. seem to have um, literal gold in their pockets. So okay, so yeah, this angry wool merchant goes into a brothel sort of a joke and is like i'll give you money help me and so there's also women involved too so you know Mm -hmm. people who work in the brothels and some sources say he had a boatman waiting on the thames um some say he was alone he claims nobody helped him and so here is his actual confession from his mouth okay 
So it's April 24th, 1303. He's planted all those seeds, literal seeds. He's about to break through the last little part of the wall. In the dead of night, our boy Dick has finally penetrated the wall to the chamber. According to him. It's become a glory hole of sorts. <laughs> it's, it's a glory hole big enough for a person to fit through. <laughs> and <laughs> according, <laughs> according to him, he slides down into this pick's chamber. <laughs> I'm not going to stop. And was sort of like struck dumb by all the treasure. Because this room is stacked with it. Like beyond it's, your wildest dreams. Just yeah. Jewels, like money. S- Smaug or like Scrooge McDuck level. Exactly, where you could dive into the money. <laughs> yeah. You know, stacks of gold bullion, um, the actual crown jewels that he just left behind, the king did, and just are chilling in there. The the crown jewels of ca- uh, countries they've conquered, such as like the the last, uh, Llewellyn, the last Prince of Wales, they took his crown. Mm-hmm. It's just sitting in there. Uh, holy relics. Gold items, silver, cru- silver and gold crucifixes, armor, decorative and practical swords, functional Wild. and decorative. Uh, one sword was said to be legendary. Like, anyway, it was it was like the scene in Aladdin where he's like in that yeah. tiger, you know, <laughs> goes in the yeah. tiger. So Richard is just like I. The cave of wonders, I believe, is what you're thinking. This is, of, but this yes. is the not the not in the tiger. It's called not, the in, cave not of inside Raja the cat, <laughs> not inside Raja <laughs> Jasmine's pet tiger, but inside you the know cave. When of they wonders. go inside the tiger, and I they know find exactly gold. what you're talking about. Yeah, and he's not supposed no, to touch anything, and then yeah, and he does continue. Yeah. Well, Richard Abu touches does. everything. does. Technically, he doesn't. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Uh, so Richard is like, this is awesome. Like three months yeah. of digging through a wall. And he is just basking in it. And he decides that he's going to spend some time in here because nobody's nobody knows where he is. Uh, and nobody he's knows literally about Borat, it. where he's just like, king in the <laughs> castle, king in the <laughs> castle. Look at me. I have a chair. I have a chair. <laughs> uh, yes. He look, we don't know what he did in there, but he was in there for two days. <laughs> <laughs> So, just cosplaying as a king. Just seriously, if I were him, I'd be like, "And I'm the king." Yep. So he's in there for two days. We don't really know what he did because he didn't go into that. Uh, but he said he just wanted to be around all the gold. But um, can't blame him, him. No, imagine just like laying down on a bed of like looted. I've always gold. wanted to Scrooge McDuck. I've always wanted to do right. that since I was a little kid. I mean, there's swords in this one, but hey, it's a little painful. But the sure, risk yeah, is more fun. <laughs> If I got stabbed to death from swimming in a giant pile of gold and then there was an ancient like Arthurian sword that like stabbed yeah. me in the face, I feel like that's a pretty good way to go. It's a dope way to I'd go. I'd be okay with that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So he claims he just enjoys basking in it, but more than likely he was organizing. So Richard was, here's one sense. area yeah. where he was smart, is that he mm-hmm. carefully picked pieces from all mm-hmm. around the area, from all around the chamber so it, it didn't even look like it had been touched. Smart, so smart. There was yeah. no, he completely left the crown jewels, any of the no swords. Trace behind, yeah. He just took small to medium pieces that had been kind of shoved to the corner or like underneath mm-hmm. other things. And so he was able to very carefully extract what he needed. And it ended up being like four bags worth, like a lot, like big, like... <laughs> I keep picturing like a robber's sack, you know? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like with a dollar sign on the outside yeah. of it. And he's like wearing <laughs> the black <laughs> and he's thing around his... Like Again, this. he just looks like a beagle boy from yeah. <laughs> Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> from DuckTales. Is... How did, you know, here's the twist is, is that everybody in this story is ducks. Listen, um, he's Scottish too. Don't forget. Scrooge right. McDuck is. Yeah. <laughs> I bet he... I bet he hit... Look, I can't oh, handle you telling long me. Shanks. I can't handle you telling me about anyone else's nationalities on this <laughs> podcast. I, I, I don't, I don't. I didn't know he was Scottish until I just pretended I knew, and then it hit me. Listen, I just want to ho- highlight this idea that he was very smart about how he robbed. He didn't just take everything like willy nilly and just d- leave it dry yeah. and clean. He made it in a way where we- it kind of reminds me of those viral videos that they show of how people at a pizza place will like steal pizza because they'll cut out like <laughs> a strip in the middle. Have you seen this? No. So they'll cut the pizza like, you know, normally you cut it directly in half, uh-huh. but they'll do sort of like a strip in the middle of it that they remove. And then yeah. they put the two pieces together, and it looks like it's like a full pizza. Oh, yeah. And then they'll cut those into into the triangle. Whoa. So it's sort of like the equivalent <laughs> of that, but with piles of gold. But with piles of treasure, yeah. 
he slowly over the next day starts lifting these bags or baskets full of treasure out and hiding them in that tall grass he planted. And again, he says he was alone. More than likely, he had people coming and getting them. He had to have somebody, to the, yeah, taking them out. He had to have. Like, yeah. This is this he, is straight Robin Hood from, the again, now the cartoon where the Prince John is sleeping and then they're just like taking yes. out all the satchels and then they're moving them <laughs> with the rope across the entire kingdom. Exactly. Like I keep, I like one of the podcasts I listened to called Cloak and Dagger, um, mm-hmm. they were saying that they could easily see it being something like a line of people. Like you just pass yeah. it along the line. Uh-huh. And they're in a cemetery, so it would be easy to duck behind tombstones yeah. uh, and kind of get out of there, you know, scot-free. I mean, I don't know. I can't be sure, but there's no way he did this alone. So he was like, no, yeah, I, I carried one of these bags by myself to the prison, went back and got another and did that over and over. All in one night or all in one. Yeah. In one day cycle. Yeah. When he finally got all of them into the prison. Mm-hmm. Here's where it goes blurry because we don't really know how it all went down this, but but nobody noticed they were gone. Nobody. Everyone was drunk. Everyone was doing their thing. No one was looking. No one even noticed sure. the hole in the wall. Like <laughs> nobody cleaned up the grass. No one cared. So let's fast forward to June. Listen, it comes back to the gardeners like we were talking about at the beginning it of does. this episode. They should have been just... mowing the lawn. <laughs> So if Long this... Shanks had hired gardeners like the people <laughs> in your neighborhood, this never would have happened. He never oh. would have been robbed blind. What an idiot. <laughs> Nobody noticed. And Richard was like, perfect. Even though he dropped a bunch of it on the way out. <laughs> like, this dude left a trail of gold. No one went in the graveyard enough to notice it. Or if they did, they were in on it. And they were going and picking it up still. So... <laughs> People okay, so fast forward to June, right? This okay, is two months later, and suddenly people are starting to find gold in their fishing nets, and they're like, "Why did I find a chalice in here? Yeah, like, the fish I just caught. Why is there a sword? This the whole hell are these fish eating? <laughs> Why? Yeah, <they're, laughs> this fish is now the king. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let's crown it. So people, like regular people, are like, "What's with all the money?" There's all this foreign money because he had a bunch of foreign money in there because, you know, oh, right. yeah, yeah. he took loans and people started having like Belgian money and French money and like crown, like little crowns and um, goblets and cups and just like stuff that's not like that looks weird. If you like if you're yeah. like a peasant holding a gold cup, it'd be like, <laughs> hmm, <laughs> like, where'd this you find that? It's the weirdest cereal surprise I've ever seen in my yeah. life. Oh. <laughs> but cool. They up their price. Yeah. Yeah, it's like some peasant being like, Kinder's I don't know, going I've... all out with their chocolates this year. <laughs> Just an entire gold goblet. Man. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, pawn shops start getting flooded with items. And they're all coming from different people. And so mm-hmm. some of these pawn shops are like, kind of see the writing on the wall. And they're like, this yeah. is not, not, not good. good. We need to sell these fast. And so... That's the mistake. Next mistake. But if I were a pawn shop owner, I'd be like, I'm putting this in the back for a little bit Mm -hmm. Uh, or whatever. So suddenly all these pawn shop people are like, everyone buy this gold, you know, trying to sell it to nobles. And they get. Oh, um, no. That's yeah. They're like, no one. So dumb. They're like, no one's buying this. Go to France and sell it or go to Belgium. Yeah. Go anywhere. (laughs) So they start like trying to sell it to like nobles and barons and lords and ladies and that's when the upper class is like, hold on, where is this coming from? And Idiots. oh, so dumb. So this is June. And remember, Edward's up there being a, a dick to the Scots. And he's like, a messenger shows up and he's like, hey, bro. Sorry. Hey, King. Hey, King Edward. Um, a ton of treasure has been showing up that looks a lot like your treasure yeah. all around London. And he's like, I don't have time for this, you know, like pissed he doesn't even go back to london he's like i don't know send some people go figure it out and and he sends some like trusted advisors or whatever and by then in london they had found the hole in the wall and then they knew and so these monks that were there were like yeah we'll do an inventory and they find out what's missing and it's about a hundred thousand pounds worth of things that they stole that's interesting that they had actually uh uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? They had actually taken inventory of everything. Oh yeah. So like they they yeah. actually knew how much was in there exactly. 
uh, yeah, Edward was extremely money um, efficient. He was like modern day capitalist, like honestly, like a <laughs> imperial. Extremely money, the money like efficient, but not like security efficient, essentially, which is what's interesting. Yeah, so why would you go through all of that to like count right. every single cent and then have no interest in taking care of it? Well, I think it's that weird. he trusted because, well, like point, I said earlier, yeah, he trusted the religion. Like there was no God was like, on his side, to, kind of thing. Yeah, almost. God was on his side. God chose yeah. him to be king. He can trust these monks. These, mm-hmm. you know, the abbot at the time was really trustworthy and shrewd and, and you know, um, on it. And so I think Richard or Edward was like, oh, yeah, it's fine. And I won't be up here for long, but he was up there for like six years. So I think like everyone kind of had trust for these like religious figures. Yeah. And by the time all this gold starts showing up all over London, they get back down there. His sorry, uh, Edward's like guys come and they start doing a search. So they're searching all this, the pubs and the brothels and they find so much treasure in these brothels <laughs> they find so much treasure the first with, place they all go i with love it monks they find treasure with the monks the, i mean when, when i say like it flooded london there was it was everywhere they, they tried to do it all at once it was not a good idea people start talking Sad. people start talking they're like oh well yeah i heard i got this you know how it goes um you don't want to yeah. get in trouble so you rat someone out and over time they find richard and they find its accomplices. And they also arrest 40 monks. So, Dear Lord. It turns out. They're all, all in the, on it? All the monks are in on it. Probably even more. Like even the abbot. They think that maybe even the abbot was in on it. It goes all the way to the top. And so they, rat, they get ratted out. They get arrested. They get put in prison for real now. And Edward's like, I'm going to deal with them when I'm done with Scotland. And they sit in prison for about two years. All of them. Wow. Before Richard comes back to London, his name's not Richard. His name's Edward. Edward, Edward. King Real Edward. Quick, um, yeah. Sorry, where did you? Maybe I spaced out when you explained this, or maybe you forgot to mention. I don't know. It. Why are, are people just throwing uh, treasures into the river or into the the bay or something? How are those fish? So end up? they think it's because when they were escaping with the treasure, they just yeah. dropped a bunch of it. Okay, so that's it. So was it close to the water? Did you explain yes. this or did you? You did. Exp- I'm sorry. I'm done. Um, Ignore me. Well, the Thames is always within like, you know, it's like a half mile maybe from the water, I want to say. So they probably walked it down to a boat and took the boat to Fleet Prison or something, they think. Or I see. Okay. Somehow these things or people panicked. Another reason is like they panicked. Oh, and just like, tossed oh, it. I can't have this. Yeah. And, and tossed it in. And It's like when know. the cops show up and you have drugs on your person. So you just got to throw it out it the up. window. Yeah. yeah, out the window. Um, so I think a lot of people tossed things into the river, which... Okay. Do you follow any mudlarking accounts? I don't even know what mudlarking is, but I can imagine it's about digging stuff up from the mud. Yeah, it's... Okay. It's like I don't want to sound. I don't want to sound just like everyone expects me to sound, but when I retire, I'm just going to go dig things out of the river. In, uh, sure. That sounds completely yeah. consistent with everything else you've said. <laughs> So mudlarkers are these people, modern day people who go to the River Thames and just like pull stuff out. And they're always finding like gold coins and stuff. So I'm sure. One of these things showed up there somewhere. Yeah. Washing up. Everyone's kind of in a panic. And I can imagine they're like, oh, they're arresting people. Start throwing this stuff in the river, which was like London's dumping ground. Everything got thrown in that river. Anyway, two years later, Edward comes back down and he's like, you know what? I, I need these monks on my side again. Because he realized there's so much corruption down here. I left and everyone went nuts. And so he orders uh, the nut, the the rest of the monks, because they had just slowly been like being questioned and let out, except for like 10 of them. And Richard was like, no, Edward, my uh, English names, man, have some creativity. Do anything but Richard or Edward or John. Edward is like, yeah, just let the monks out. Like, just let them out. It's fine. I'm, they're whatever. Because they were like, we didn't do it. And... Richard Dick was like, I was alone. And he stood by that statement until he until they hung him. They hanged him. Mm. They executed him. And he kept his mouth shut about anyone else who was involved. And he think they think he probably saved like dozens of people from the gallows. That's awesome. Yeah. A few of his other conspirators were were also hanged. And I don't know which ones because, of course, I couldn't find any books on it. The Tramp. Oh, yeah. Old Johnny Keys. (laughs) 
Or William was it Billy Keys? Keys? Billy, Billy Keys, Keys. Yeah. yeah. Billy, Billy Keys, Keys, The Tramp, and then John the not Mason. Blacksmith. What was he? Mason. Yeah. Mason. Johnny Mace. Johnny, Johnny Mace. Mace. Billy Johnny Keys. <laughs> Billy Keys. And, and the, the Tramp. The, the Tramp. What was? That? Yeah. And the, the Tramp was the chaplain. Yeah. Yeah. Remember and him the chaplain was so the Tramp. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. Billy so, Keys. I like Billy so, Keys because he also plays keyboard in the band. He does, <laughs> and this is a band, and yeah. um. They perform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my. We should do that. Let's start a band. Listen, they're already the doing heist, it on the Discord. <laughs> the 1303 heist. Oh, they are. You're right. 500 open bands. No. 500 open bands. Poor Richard dies. But a lot of these, don't, a lot of the jewels and the stuff, they never show up. So some people actually got away with it. And some people nice. got away with the treasure. And Edward is furious. He's so pissed off. Good. And Honestly, like if I were Richard, I'd be so proud of myself that I pissed the king off as much as he yeah, pissed me off to no to no degree, yeah. And that I stole one year's worth of tax collection. That's yes. how much it equaled. That's and awesome. Gave it out to every poor person around me. Amazing. So he like anyway, he's kind of my hero. I yeah. love Richard. He's you know. Anyway, Edward's like, okay, I need to like consolidate my treasury, so we're gonna put all of this in the Tower of London and guard it with guards, yeah. <laughs> and that's why we have the Tower of London being the place where literally everything is kept, even to this day. Okay, because of this robbery. That's this, really this cool. Is, yeah. So I mean, the robbery is uh, really cool, not the Tower of London, like saving money from the people that you stole the money from. That sucks. Right. But yeah. I don't I like that I mean, that's that what kings do. So within a f- like 50 years, there's going to be the Peasants' Revolt uh, because everyone's so angry at the king. Um, and this kind of set it off, all these taxes and people are realizing we hate these guys. Uh, the plague is going to reset the social structure. Um, mm-hmm. And by the end of the 1400s, they're going to have a, par- a parliament. Um, and that is when they establish parliament. And then it just becomes 300 more years of parliament and the king butting heads. Mm-hmm. Until they pretty much take all his power away at the when they behead him. Anyway, if you remember, there's that old door on Westminster Abbey. I do. With the skin on it. Yes. Sadly, it is cow skin. But for about okay. 500 years, people believed that it was Richard of Pudlicott's skin. Because uh, before okay. they hung him, they flayed him. And, Ooh. oh yeah, they took that skin right off. Um, I mean, I, if I were, you know... The king, I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to put your skin on a door. Don't tell them it's a cow, but like, tell them it's, ri- tell them it's Richard. Um, yeah. But they did DNA testing in like 2005 or something. And they're like, sorry, guys, it's cow. And everyone's like, darn. Lame. <laughs> um, but for a long time there, everyone believed it was Richard's uh, Dick Pudlicott's skin on that door. And uh, if you're in London, you can go see that door. That's it. And you can also go see the chamber where they've kept all the treasure. It's free. It's free to enter. You don't have to like pay. It's very cool. Anyway, that's the uh, great heist of 1303. Fantastic. I loved it. Yep. Uh, just a little bit of a PSA here. If you do steal from the king and yeah. you get a bunch of crowns and jewels, the, the reason that they call it money laundering is that you need to take your money and you need to launder yes. it through something else. There is, here's the thing that people forget. You're going to pay a fee. That's the whole point. Yeah, is that that's if how you, they make if you their take money. A, well, not even if you make your money, but I'm saying if you steal a million dollars, you're not going to walk away with a million dollars. You're going to have to lose some money in order way, in order to have that money come out the other end clean. So if you're lucky, through a maybe it's a process through a trusted process. So in this case, to anybody listening in the 1300s, take yeah. those jewels and that money, hire a ship, go into mainland yeah. Europe, sell it to a bunch of people who have no idea what's going on, who are not interested in any of it, who are willing to pay a yes. high premium, lie to them about where you got it. Take that money. It's going to uh-huh. cost you for the ship and whatever. You know, you're going to have to have a per diem. You're going to have <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Living, yeah. Night hotel expenses. At the end of the day, you might walk away with, let's say, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. So you've lost two hundred thousand dollars. However, but that money is now clean. And if anyone comes to ask you, you don't have to show them. You're just like, yeah, whatever. I have eight hundred thousand dollars. I don't know. I just did work for a Not long your time. Business. I don't have any jewels. <laughs> yeah. And then you take it's- that money and you go somewhere else. Right. And I'm, you know what? I'm pretty sure a lot of people did that. The ones that they never traced. They got away. I, yeah. I think there are people who were like, I'm going to a port. Even if I can't leave the country, I'm going to go sell this to some like because they're at this point, we're trading with like people from all over the world. People people yeah. don't realize that. But 
people from Asia and the Middle East were coming up and trading with England. And easy, easy to just be like, hey, can I come? Sold it to some Chinese trader or something that came over here or whatever. Right. Yep. Uh, Or you take it and you get like a bunch of whatever. It's the Silk Road. You get a bunch of silk. Yeah. And then you have the asset and then you sell that. And then Then that's how you make your money. Yes. Or or just, yeah, you get involved in some other stuff that's above ground. Easy. Listen, neither of us are criminals, but we are we could do it. Don't pawn it. If you really it. wanted. <laughs> yeah. Don't just straight pawn it. You got to hold on to it. You got to, yeah. it's an investment. I hate yeah. to see somebody like Richard get killed because they didn't do that correctly. And don't stay in the same town that you stole from. That's Bro, a bad idea. Bro, seriously. Go, just I leave. Mean, I, can, I can see how it's like, yeah, screw the king. We're going to spend yeah. this money. And, you know. When you're drunk, you don't make the best money decisions. True, <laughs> so, true, true. Uh, I have to remember, remind you that a lot of these monks were drunk. Anyway, um, so yeah, fantastic. thanks for your PSA. That, thank you for your story. It was wonderful. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, no, of course. Huge fan. This guy is another one of our friends to now add to like our wall of heroes, of people that we yeah. like that are awesome Tom and did Blood. cool stuff. Uh, Tom Blood. That's Dick it. Pudlycock. <laughs> All Dick these Pudlycock. All these names are people absurd. Who, <laughs> Existed in episodes more than two episodes ago that I've now forgotten because I have the, the memory of a fish. With which we we said the names at one point. We did. I don't but know. We salute you. Salute. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go pat that door and pretend it's actually his skin and say thanks, Dick. Listen, DNA tests have been known to be inconclusive, so I'm hoping yeah. that in this case it's basically the same thing where they're like, actually, somebody who did the DNA test at the lab accidentally like dropped brought cow their blood into cow this. In. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Brought their, brought... It was bring your cow to work day. <laughs> bring your cow to work day. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Everything that day came back as cow. Anyway, what do you have for uh, me? Okay. That you wouldn't let me see in the document. That I wouldn't let you see in the document. Yes, just so people know. Last time, um, I put the we have a doc that we share where we keep all the links yeah. in before we start the for, for all the show notes and hannah had looked at the title On of the last accident. episode it's true it was by accident so i was like i'm not going to do that this time so i where i would he normally wrote, write the title of the article i wrote what did i say you, in all caps you wrote um <laughs> you don't get to read this in advance hannah <laughs> <laughs> So um, I would like you to have your phone nearby because this is going to be something where I'm going to be texting you a bunch of random stuff. Yes. My tab is, in fact, a listener email that I decided to expand upon. Oh, this is the second time you've done this, huh? This is the second time. Um, Unfortunately, it's not Nico from Riverside, although shout out Mm. to Nico. Thank you for the last time. Uh, Nico did send me send us another article, which I thought was cool that I told you to not read because I saw it before you did. Yeah, um, but TBD and I didn't. on that one. You didn't, thankfully. Uh, but this email came from Karen in Renton, Washington. Okay. And Karen sent us this fantastic article. And <laughs> you ready for the title? Absolutely. Testicular Tanuki Tales Japanese folk humor for children with ribald satirical twist. <laughs> There's so many syllables in there. I'm going to explain Is- it. This is like the reading. It's like reading the moon hoax papers. So many words. That, so many words. This actually did uh, spark my interest somewhat. It's nothing to do with the moon hoax, but it's you'll you'll hear you'll understand the places in which I thought it was similar. So, this is not Ooh. a joke. It comes okay. from a blog from Princeton University, <laughs> and it is this fantastic analysis i don't say this uh lightly it really is a very good analysis of a series of prints and gives them all context both culturally and historically so uh you can understand what it's about and i was really tempted to just read the whole article like just on the air but i decided (laughs) that i should actually just do my job um so (laughs) that's all podcasts are just reading yeah just reading somebody else's work yeah so right off the bat, are you familiar with what a tanuki is? I have no idea. You have no idea. Okay. So no. th- I'm, I'm going to send you a couple of pictures of tanukis. Why don't you go describe to the audience what tanukis <gasps> oh. look like? Oh, they kind of look like little raccoon bears. They're fluffy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They've got like rounded ears. They, oh, their eyes are really close together and they look like they're in a constant state of panic. Yeah. Um, uh, so they're yeah. actually known as rec. They they kind of call them the raccoon dog. They're yeah. Japanese. They're but cute. That that's a point of contention because uh, technically, apparently, they're neither a dog nor a raccoon. They're somewhere in between. 
Um, Weird. So people make an argument that they're technically like their own thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I tried to read about the weird genetic code, Jurassic Park DNA, something or other sequencing about it. And I was like, I don't understand what any of this means. And I'm confused. So whatever. T Tanuki want, is its own thing. I want to go to Tanuki Park instead of Jurassic Park. Gigantic. Wait till you hear the rest of this tab. You're going to oh, absolutely want to go to Tanuki Park. <laughs> there's a park. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> no, no, there's no real park. But I just mean like the more you learn about Tanuki, you're going to be really excited. Kay. So Tanuki are mostly nocturnal. And when they speak, they sound like domesticated cats, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Annoying. They are predominantly monogamous and typically live for about Aww. seven to eight years. Hey, so one. to recap, <laughs> a Tanuki is a raccoon dog that meows like a cat, marries its high school sweetheart <laughs> and dies at eight. <laughs> Look, I don't want no slut tanukis, okay? <laughs> I don't want I don't want some loose tanuki. What, is that how you say it? Loose tanuki. <laughs> loose. I need a monogamous, dedicated tanuki, all right? Straight. S <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, tanuki <laughs> Tanuki are important figures in Japanese folklore. Uh, they're known as mischievous shapeshifters that are often oh? portrayed with with comically large stretched out scrotums <laughs> dude you know what this reminds me of and yes the thing you something... messaged me last night <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry about all those chaotic memes i sent you i looked uh, no, over I just, them and was i was like perfect no it was really funny i wanted to respond to you because i was like oh my god you don't even know just so you guys know hannah said, sent me like yeah. a like an ai video of yoshi from mario brothers with ball sacks with like giant balls <laughs> And that ties right into this tab. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. We're on the same wavelength. And then you looked at it right before bed. And that made me really happy. I was like, I hope he, I hope this is the last thing he sees when he, before he goes to sleep. Uh, it was. This reminds me of my pet rats. That's a whole different story, but I had a ton of pet rats at one point in my life. And mm -hmm. the male rats, once they're comfortable with you, they just let their balls at, ball sack out. <laughs> and it's, dude, it's it's gigantic. Like if it were on okay. a human, they'd be like cantaloupe sized. And my my rat, I had a rat named Rasputin, and Rasputin <laughs> had gigantic balls. Much like the real Rasputin, whipped his balls out everywhere he went. All the he did, yeah, he really did. Um, so my rat Rasputin, I would call his name, go Rasputin, and he'd run up my arm, dragging his balls <laughs> along with him all the way up my arm, and then he'd nes nes nestle himself right here in my. In my like cleavage, clavicle. <laughs> no, inside my cleavage. Oh, inside your cleavage. And I remember just being like, I could just feel that pulse. <laughs> this story was way cuter in my head. Okay. <laughs> so that's what that reminded me of. So anyway, tanukis <laughs> and the huge balls. But they're uh, huge balls, <laughs> and their nut sacks are not just for show; they're also magic. So. <gasps> Within folklore and within the art of a lot of Japanese prints, they will use them as parachutes, chairs, <laughs> umbrellas, backpacks, chairs? blankets, weapons, hats, capes, and countless other useful accessories. Chairs? <laughs> They're built in. I'm so excited. You have okay. no idea what you're in for right now. <laughs> and... I might be making a lot of like insane noises, by the way. <laughs> And according to everything I've read, this isn't some like, oh, you shouldn't laugh at other cultural traditions and be insensitive. The Japanese are like fully in on it. And they're like, dude, yeah. balls are funny as hell. And those weird <laughs> raccoon dogs that talk like cats have huge balls. And like, this is we love this. We're going with it. <laughs> We're going with love it. And furthermore, love that. their testicles symbolize good fortune and wealth. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> so the Japanese well. term can... Yeah, I'll tell you. So the Japanese okay. term kintama, which means golden balls, plays yes. into this. The most popular theory as to why is championed by a researcher named Shigeo Uwaku, Uwaku who, uh, and the theory goes that back in the Edo period, metal workers in Kanazawa Prefecture used to make gold leaf sheets by putting the gold between tanuki skin to hammer it flat. What? Yeah. Uh, okay. And beca because the skin was so durable, it allowed them to stretch the metal <laughs> unbelievably thin. <laughs> so they got good skin. They got great skin. They were just hammering that's, on it and it was helping them just, you know, kind of like. Would stretch over a door real nice, right? Ex stretch over a door. Exactly. It could have been tanuki balls that were on that d the door that you were mentioning in the previous tab. Probably. And so basically over time. This all got muddled up and like people were making jokes and eventually tanuki balls became associated with gold and then being rich. 
<laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> that, that 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 makes sense. Like you just that's the that's the logical next step. It sounds like something we would have come up with if we were da- there at definitely. the same time. So <clears throat> it's now Dude, history, associated. History would be so much more full of dumb ball jokes if we had been back then. <laughs> Uh, it's now a sign of good luck and prosperity, and many shops in Japan will just have a tanuki with giant balls outside, and it's cool <laughs> as hell. So here we go. Why don't you describe this to the Let's people see. who are listening? Okay, I need a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's like it, it's almost like the style of a garden gnome. It's like a little yeah. ceramic figure, but it's got gig- it's just this little bear thing holding a frog. Sitting mm-hmm. on its own balls, but it also has fully formed boobs. Uh, and I don't, I'm just, I don't know, man. <laughs> this is It's got cute. a giant hat. <laughs> it's got a, this isn't cute. Oh, here's another one. Oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> okay, so this one looks like it has been, it, it has just seen someone get shot. His eyes are huge and wide. <laughs> And its <laughs> mouth is gaping open. It's made of wood. It has a big old hat on. Still has those boobs. And this time, it looks like it doesn't even have legs. It just has balls. So, mm-hmm. wow. Yep. What? <laughs> oh, oh, we're no. just beginning, Hannah. We're just oh, beginning. No. Oh, no. Karen, this is such a good tab. Oh, this one has a penis, too, by the way. I didn't see that. I yep. was too focused on the balls. Oh, he's got... Wow. The eyes, man. The eyes are particularly funny with that one. So, yeah. <clears throat> fun fact. I know that you know a special tanuki already. You want to take a no. guess as to who it is? No. Don't. Tanuki Tom Nook. <laughs> <laughs> that capitalist bastard. He's a tanuki? So, I I didn't get like proper didn't confirmation so. from I I don't there's no like official like Nintendo stance on this, but I did read somewhere that the theory is that Tom Nook's, so Nook Inc.'s logo are leaves, remember? <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> and so yeah. My, I, so the theory is like, that's all related to this. It's like leaves, Tanuki, wealth, prosperity, all that kind of stuff. So You know, that guy does need to have pretty big balls to ask for how as much money as he does for me to just so live on that island. Listen, just next time, I know that you avoid your island because you're afraid of all the shame and guilt of everyone being mad at you, but yeah, just be but careful. I... <laughs> if, if you don't pay your bells... You don't know what Tom Nook's packing under those cargo shorts and what he might He's do to you if you don't fall into me. line. <laughs> bounce up to me on those, on his giant balls. I'm, my head is so messed up right now with what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> like, Mel Gibson is Australian. Tom Nook has big old balls. I'm looking at something that should be cute, but it's not. As I always say, it's going to get crazier. It's going to get crazier. So. Good. The article that Karen sent us concerns a couple of specific prints that were made during the Meiji era, which was from 1868 to 1912. Uh, Now, until this point, Japan had very famously cut itself off from the rest of the world in an attempt to resist colonization by Western powers. I'm sure you already Mm -hmm. know about this. Many people know about this. Yeah. Um, And when Emperor Meiji took over in 1868 and consolidated power, he was like, nope, no more. He flung the doors open of Japan to everybody and went hard right. in an attempt to modernize the country and make it a world power. You know, they embraced modernity. They were ordering all kinds of packages from Amazon. Everyone got on the mm-hmm. TikTok. They stopped wearing ankle socks. They're like, yep. we're the cool new young kids now. They told, kept telling everybody that parting your hair on the side makes you look old and dumb. And it, you know, exactly. Makes it really... They got rid of all their skinny jeans. They just threw them into the water. They burned them. They started using cool terms. Anyway, so this period is known very famously as the Meiji Restoration. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, I don't know how much you know about it, but it's it's a legitimately fascinating topic. There's like a billion podcasts about this. I think Diane Carlin did like a billion part series, as he always does, he for did. Hardcore History <laughs> about it. Yeah. Um, it's really it's it's a really interesting period in in time um, to learn about. And yeah. um, as, as far as like just you know, Western sort of points that we of reference that we can use. The most famous example is, um, do you guys remember, I don't know if you remember The Last Samurai with Tom Cruise, where he was like the- It's been so long. He was like the Civil War soldier that gets called back to to Japan. He he gets commissioned to come like teach them about- so it's a it's a yeah. decent it's like from two thousand three, four, five, somewhere around there. It's very I, like it's I from the white perspective. It. Yeah, they yeah. all are. 
it's a decent flick, but like it's got some problems. And um, I actually I did remember reading an interesting piece of criticism about that film that went beyond just like Tom Cruise White, like White, center of narrative, yeah. like which is sort of your obvious one, but. It was an interesting criticism of the of romanticizing the samurai class and how the samurai were like because yeah. they, they were basically pushed to the side like, and they were like you're not part of this anymore and the samurai were like we're all about history and like you're giving yeah. up on your old terms and but they were like yeah that was also because they liked the idea that they were sort of the the class that was in charge and started oh, suddenly yeah. their station in life was being quest it was uh, being challenged and anyway it's it's. It's just yeah, an interesting but... way to like look into it and read in different things about it. Th that's sort of all what's happening here. Yeah. Um, it's very, very much worth into reading. I've mentioned Japanese history on here before. It's all really cool. Um, okay. And like any non-Western history, it's very interesting and, and we don't ever learn about it. So you kind of have Never. to take it upon yourself to read. But the stories are really cool. And so, you have to go anyway. deep sometimes to not have a white perspective or at least a Western perspective on it. Exactly. Anyway. So anyway, at this point, like I said, Japan's modernizing, crazy fast. Uh, Tom Cruise is coming in all drunk and trying to regain his honor and on all, all these soldiers and how to kill these pesky samurai. But he gets captured because he's bad at his job. And as always is the case in every example of countries trying to modernize too quickly, a lot of people, mainly the people who are not part of like the aristocracy and the rich class are like, dude, what the hell? I got whiplash. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Poor They're guy. just like, what? <laughs> Bro, Who? I don't have a bunch of money. This is not awesome. We don't like this. What are you I doing? I just want to farm. I don't know. What are we doing? And it's always the people with money who are the ones who are super into it and they care about it. Of course. Of and course. like you said, they're farmers. A lot of them are just like, dude, yeah. I'm up in Shingo trying to raise, <laughs> I'm trying to tend to my garlic farm. What's all this riffraff about right. steam engines? Well, it's it's interesting because you know what does a really good job of, have you ever read Game of Thrones? Nope. It's it does a great job showing what it would what it's like from like a peasant's perspective where they'll just be like mm -hmm. doing their work and be like, oh, there's a new king. OK, whatever. Yeah. And they'll just get back to their work because they don't care as yeah. long as things stay relatively the same. It's like, you know, it's, they're so far, far disconnected that it's like and the Game of Thrones is not real, but it is based on actual. No, it's medieval. the idea is that like a lot of these times, these kings kind of like you're talking about or or whatever kingdoms or governments, they end up implementing like economic reforms that make a lot of money for the state, but they don't necessarily uh -huh. implement like social reforms where that money gets distributed or sort of reinvested into the communities that they're serving. Right. So you end up having these like bigger and bigger divides. That wasn't necessarily the case, I think, in Japan at this time. But okay. um, that does at least initially end up being like, well, whatever. Cool. There's a steam engine. What do I care? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just want to farm my rice paddy and let's get let's move on with this. And so people are upset and they stage a revolt, right? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Of course no. not. Much like you oh. and I, they make snarky <laughs> cartoons about how things are dumb and they also draw animals with insanely gigantic balls, shape-shifting oh into stuff. Gosh. But like, you know, political. <laughs> no, there's no... That, look, that was an excuse. Yeah. Wait. I love so, this. Now, okay. we're going to be laughing about these for the next few minutes, but which we're meant to be doing. We're, we're meant to laugh at this. That's the function of them. But I just want to say up front how much I love these prints and how much I legitimately admire them. Because you know what it made me think of was a couple episodes ago when we had Miles on and we were talking yeah. about the lioness upon the cheese grater. Yeah. And we were all laughing about like how people tend to assign this sort of like nobility to things throughout history yeah. like and being like reverence. very serious. Yeah, yeah. Reverence for them as if people in the past didn't have a sense of humor. And if the, as if they weren't dirtbags like us. Like Exactly. Yeah. It, it, we've been <laughs> Like this for as long as we've existed. Yeah. Some of the so, oldest art is pictures of penises. Right. <laughs> or what was it? Woman farts was the one that Miles brought up. Yeah. Yeah. The woman oldest fart. stories. The oldest joke is about a lady farting. Yeah. So we're so I, I, dumb. We're so dumb. And I say this with all sincerity. If my legacy would have been to make something as awesome as some of these prints and uh, <laughs> somebody would like read this like 150 years later, I will have considered my artistic career a success. Oh yeah, same. <laughs> so, agreed. Woodblock prints. Woodblock print artists of this period rose to some prominence, working in a genre for young audiences known as uh, omacha e, which were called toy prints. I apologize for the pronunciation, if it's not correct. Um, these cheap, usually single sheet woodblock prints were ostensibly for kids, but had crossover appeal for people of all ages. And like the magazine tabloids of today, they claim to share the latest knowledge or gossip about any given subject. Thus, the title of these prints. So we're going to be talking about two specific prints. One is called okay. The Latest Tanuki Entertainments, 
And the second one is Compendium of the Latest Tanuki Amusements. And both of these prints published a year apart depict an exhaustive series of variations on the theme of Tanuki Kintama transformations. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So here's the first print. And just let it wash over you for a second. We're going to get into the specifics of all of this. But just tell everybody this is a reaction video. So explain to everybody what you're looking at. Obviously, on the video version, people will see it on screen. But for people who are listening. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, are these all balls? Is this all balls? Yes. This is all All balls. balls. Okay. 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 So I'm looking at what well, is what I'm looking at. It's like um, it looks like a grid with a bunch of different fi- pictures, different cartoons, and in each one, it's like a comic strip. But each one, mm-hmm. it has these guys doing something different with their balls, or even just the skin, like the the scrotum. Like this one, he's using it as a hot air balloon. <laughs> what looks like a hot air balloon. This one uh-huh. is using his as like a like what well, looks like a trumpet. <laughs> um oh this one oh this one's just got one big ball hanging out of his pants and he's banging it like a drum this one this one he's using it as a shawl he just like has it around his and these are all tanuki oh what's going on oh i don't even know how to describe that one uh this one's <laughs> flung it over his shoulder and he's like ro- prancing away with it I don't even, some of these i don't even know <laughs> This one has like its balls have legs <laughs> like separate from his own. Oh, this one's just wow. He's trying this one's trying to shove his ball sack into a barrel. It's massive. Oh, he's using it as a blanket. Oh, a koi pond. This one, they've stretched this this balls out and filled it with water and fish. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Dude, I, have, yep. I have whiplash. These are beautiful yeah. drawings. <laughs> I knew you'd beautiful. be speechless. Dude, the colors. Every, like, artistically, these are amazing. And it's all balls. <laughs> <laughs> it's all ball- a kite. This one's using them as a kite. <laughs> okay. 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 Continue. So- I'm so remember, okay, so the first print, like I said, it's Latest Tanuki Entertainments. The artist is Kobayashi uh, Aijiro, and okay. it's from 1884. So at first glance, you'd think, LOL, it's a bunch of Tanuki balls, and it's hilarious, mm-hmm. which it is. But it there's is. actually more going on here. Explain. And so I will. So the thing is, um, this literally is like the Simpsons episode, like a Simpsons episode of the, of its day. Because it's making homages to past arts and artists while simultaneously skewering the political and upper classes. Awesome. Okay. So the artistic inspiration for these panels come from an artist uh, named Utagawa Kuniyoshi, who lived from um, 1798 to 1861, a renowned Edo period woodblock artist who popularized testicular tanuki transformations, coming up with numerous variations on the theme. So the first (laughs) image I'm going to show you, this is from the artist who was from like, whatever, like about 100 years before, from the Edo period, from Kuniyoshi. Oh, wow. (laughs) What is going on? Oh, so let me explain this one while you look at it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what what is happening. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. ex- please explain. The image is a play on the Zen Buddhist cone, how do you catch a catfish with a gourd? Um, <gasps> and also the belief that a giant mythological catfish thought to cause earth- earthquakes under the islands of Japan could only be controlled with the god Kashima if he placed a giant rock on its head to suppress it. So in uh. Kuniyoshi's print... <laughs> The tanuki is placing its giant ball sack on the head of the catfish to stop yep. it, f- stop earthquakes from coming and saving the day. <laughs> we got to implement this in California. I agree. So, <clears throat> in why is the... he also standing on top of a different tanuki? He's just like using it as a surfboard. I think they're just helping each other out. They're oh, just okay. like I need to be like a step ladder of some sort because this I fish, see. this catfish, is so big. So, <laughs> in two of the panels. Of our first print of the um, latest Tanuki Entertainments. Yeah. If you look at oh. it. Oh, yeah. I was trying to figure out what this one was. It looks like he's trying to shove he's some, p- some. He's putting the, the ball sacks so on top uh-huh. of the catfish. So they're trying to mm-hmm. stop the earthquakes. So it's a reference to that like old Buddhist little story. <laughs> and there's another one. Wow. This is so, this has like five layers of cultural like. Right. 
You, you can't even. I, I would never. I would never understand. So he's the the artist is literally he's giving a shout out to like the olden days. Or so when I think of Simpsons, I think of like a lot of those old episodes would give references to yeah. like like old movies and stuff as a way right. of like the visual reference point or the visual language that people would be familiar with. Or even just like the couch scene using different animations that pay homage yeah, yeah, to, yeah. you know. That little template. Um, so there's more references in Kuniyoshi's work throughout this print, but critically to the piece are the clothing that a lot of these Tanuki are wearing. Um, okay. Kobayashi is dressing them in Western garb, which implies they're members of the upper and political classes, uh-huh. and they have fancy jobs or have traveled abroad and are taking on the costumes of Westerners. So if uh. you look at, you actually pointed out a couple of them specifically when you were looking. Yeah. Um, the one with the guy slung over his shoulder with the ball sack. Yeah. Uh, that's meant to be a postman with his uh, with oh. the hat and the outfit and he's wearing in the pants. Oh, yeah. And then the guy with the ball sack on the drums. Yeah, that's my favorite right? one, I think. He's from like a Western style marching band. And then the one with the shawl <laughs> also wearing like a cool Western hat. That's just like a fancy person. So, yeah. These woodprints are essentially taking aim and clowning on these people. And they're like, oh, cool. You're a postman. Have fun slinging your ball sack post office bag over your shoulder. Oh, you're a drummer in a Western style band. How about you drum on these nuts? <laughs> I'm, I'm speechless. Amazing. I, I, I just saw another one and it's <laughs> this one is a boat. They made a boat out of the balls. And they're sailing away on it. <laughs> so these are just like <laughs> hilarious and awesome and a million times smarter and funnier than Young Sheldon, which is, I know, your favorite show of all time. But How this is much funnier. You. Than- <laughs> that, I can't even handle that as a joke. That is, <laughs> it, even the thought of someone maybe taking that seriously makes me want to die. <laughs> I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to unalive myself. Okay. I understand. Uh, anyway, so that first piece, it's a total of 36 different little panels. So it is it's kind amazing. of. Again, I, I, as I always like to do on this show, I always mention um, shout outs to our you know, lineage or the people that came before us. So it's like you said, this is sort of like right here. the comic artist of its day. It is. But it goes so far back, like way further back than anything. It's satire. Western. Yeah. It's, it's satire. Like, it's, it's cartoonish. It, I mean, it's about it balls, you know? It's about balls. That's the most important thing. That is the most. It's all I can. I can kind of only see that. I think that's what you're meant to. Yeah. Oh, there's one more. Okay, so just a couple quick little references. So there's this little trio. Like you said, there's the boat. There's the person uh, with, what did you say? He was like fishing with them. Yeah, like a fishing net made of ball skin. Made of ball skin. So um, this goes back to um, Kuniyoshi. So this is the print that it's referencing that is a heightened version of this where it looks like four of them together or Four of these um, <laughs> Tanukis together have one giant ball sack that they're fishing with. But it's from the Edo period, so it's like the previous period of it. This is my favorite one so far. <laughs> they have all taken out their shared ball sack and made a huge <laughs> fishing net out of it. I'm, I'll am i never do that. I'll never be as... I, how come we'll I never top do this? this? I'll never top this. Oh, what's this one? This one <laughs> is... Oh my gosh, what is happening? <laughs> It's it's like about it's raining, so they're just covering their heads as a way to stay dry. Is it one gigantic ball set? Oh no, they each have their own gigantic. Okay, okay, okay. Wow. <laughs> I like how there's like hair on them too. Like these aren't it's accurate. like cutesy. Like they're hairy. They're hairy. Okay, so that's that's the first print that's covered in this article. Okay. Okay, so next up is Compendium of the Latest Tanuki Amusements by Kuniaki from 1883. This one, <laughs> we'll get into the specific panels, oh. but why don't you explain the difference between this one and the previous one for people who okay. are listening. Okay. First of all, different art style, but also, mm. oh, interesting. <laughs> they're they're a little bit more animalistic. Like the, the, these, these guys are actually shaped like animals. The other ones were like humans with Tanuki heads. Mm-hmm. Oh! He's riding his balls like a bike. Unicycle. Okay, I gotta, I gotta take a second to absorb. Hold on. <laughs> okay. So, just for people listening, both of these I'm... have, you know, they they basically have like three colors. Primarily, it's like a yellow, yeah. blue, and a red, more or less. But mm-hmm. um, the second print, what's interesting about it is that it's, I I think it's funny because um, 
it's much more it's less obvious that it's meant to be skewering something yeah. they looks like somewhat more traditional closer to like, like the reference from pastoral, the previous one from the edu almost, yeah yeah they look more like scenes uh -huh. like fr almost like storyboards or something or like proper you know scenic illustrations rather than just yeah. like one off quick graphic drawings um, it's so mm. it looks a much it looks much more deadpan, which I think makes it much more funny. I, I think because you funnier. kind of it's like regular everyday stuff, and it's like, oh yeah, I just got to use this as my bike, and it it's <laughs> like it has a calm. It's not so like um, extreme, you know what I mean? It's not like yeah. look at this kite made out of balls. It's like this is my ball sack bike, <laughs> and I'm going to work. I don't. That's the vibe I get. Like, mm -hmm. so let's focus on the one panel, which is actually the one I was going to talk about that you brought up. Which bike. I'll, I'll uh, yeah, Remember, it's a unicycle. Sorry, so explain I'm it sorry. to everybody. So there's this tanuki, and he's wearing what looks like a like a smoking jacket, mm -hmm. uh, and some nice white slacks, and he is operating a unicycle made of his ball sack, going down <laughs> a country road, and you know it's nice clear skies. There's some nice uh, bushes in the background. There's a flag, a flag in the background. There's a so flag that has some writing on it. So apparently <clears throat> the red flag on the background of this particular scene, it says uh, Gyaniku, which means okay. beef. So okay. the Tanuki critically is on a West, he's wearing Western style clothing and oh. he's on this unicycle and he's going to get beef theoretically. Because Westerners and so love beef. Beef. And, and for what critically is like most common people would have not been able to afford uh, beef right. at all at this time. So Especially again, it's this thing where... Yeah, so they're just they're kind of making fun of like, oh, look at this dumbass like riding his unicycle and his ball is going to get like a hamburger. Screw this beef. guy. Give me a second. Oh. I'll never, I'll never top this in my whole we career. Never, I'll never, never top. We can it. just give up. We no, have to just give we, up. It's still I'm over. retiring. I'm just gonna fully go into podcasting now. No, no more art for me. It's already been done. It's been done. I'm yelling a lot today. So this one is my, this one's my favorite. <laughs> okay. And okay. okay. What is, uh, okay. Okay. So this is a guy. <laughs> okay. This is a Tanuki and he's posing for a photo, but it looks like he's using his ball sack as something to lean on, like as a prop. Mm -hmm. As he like poses, and then there's the cameraman Tanuki, and he has draped. <laughs> you know those old timey cameras with you to put the cloth over your head. Yep. He has he has delicately draped his ball set balls over his head so he can block the light from the photo when he takes the photo, <laughs> and he's taking the photo. <laughs> <laughs> this is beautiful <laughs> and, and the, the whole air is like look at, look at me i'm fancy enough to have a photo taken and yeah i i you know this is perfect this is perfect this is perfect. <laughs> that is the exact reaction i was hoping to get from you <laughs> okay. okay okay go on you have to go on you have to go on i can't stop laughing <laughs> I'm so sweaty. I'm so sweaty. I'm, I'm brushing the my ball hair. Sack, you're brushing your, the ball sack camera has broken you. It uh, broke, I mean, it broke me for sure. Listen, these are two of the greatest <laughs> pieces of art I've ever seen in my life. I will never not ever, remember these. Ever. I mean, I uh, mean, like. Go ahead. What were you going to say? You, you can't. You can't. I already said this, but you can't top this. Like. <laughs> So oh, okay. lastly, so that's so this article sort of goes a little bit more in depth into this. But again, shout out to our comic ancestors. But lastly, I wanted Salute. to briefly discuss Tanuki train legends oh, because there's trains tra in this. There were train boys here. Love trains. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, a train, train boy, boy. Janice. <laughs> Uh, there's no artwork for this, but this is just part of the okay. Tanuki like Meiji oh, Meiji period. So I love a um, train. <clears throat> I know you do. So in many parts of Japan during the Meiji period, <laughs> stories emerged about train operators who claimed to hear the whistle of oncoming trains only to find that the train would suddenly disappear in the moment of contact. And later oh, when they went creepy. to investigate, there were almost invariably one or more dead tanuki on the tracks. 
Oh, oh. People essentially, and these stories continued for a while, like well into the 50s, I think almost is what I was reading. And so they were just like, oh, like they're tricksters. They're just making the sound of other uh, trains come in to like throw off the train to operators. And they sort of became like this symbol of resistance. But um, according Whoa. to Michael Dylan Foster, who's a professor of Japanese at UC Davis, uh, there are many allegorical interpretations of the tale from industry versus the environment to the foreign versus the native. I was going to say that tales, feels like old school versus new, you know, like exactly old ways versus this new technological advance that people aren't comfortable with yet. These tales can be read as the forces of traditional Japanese views taking a stand through the use of oh, yep. deception and tanuki magical powers of old against the forces of industrial change and modernity and ultimately tragically failing. Um, oh. That the tanuki is overpowered and killed by the train symbolizes not just the futility of opposing the advent of steam trains um, and industrialization, but indicates the acceptance of that futility, enshrining yeah. it in a folk tale. I feel that. Yeah, I don't, I don't very know much why, so. But like, oh, uh, you know exactly why. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one quick reference. So the American equivalent I thought of when I was reading that was was. Um, do you remember the story of John Henry? Yeah, the railroad guy, right? Yeah, yeah, the guy who was like, there's yep. like a digging machine that's like coal uh -huh. powered or industrial, and he was like, I can dig faster than you, and he just sort of fights it, and then he wins, but then he dies at the end of it, right? Because, because like an embolism bursts everything. in his head or something, yeah, right. And it's like this symbolic victory of like how humanity and you know people can win over machines, but still like the the march of progress and of industrial uh, industrialization Never continues. Stopped. It's sort of a similar thing. Uh, that's happening around a similar well, time. It's almost like um, an acceptance. Like it's like yeah. I'm gonna take control of this story by being like these little these little testicle raccoon dudes <laughs> are gonna are a symbol of our culture and it's gonna try its best to stop the train, but it will die. And at least I had the I have the story. I, at least we're in control of the story. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Also, it's like a weird acceptance, like grief. It's like griefing. Mm hmm. I think it's really, really fascinating. It's really interesting. And in, in terms of modern day parallels of what you're talking about is the thing I kept thinking about is like the battle within our entire industry and like yeah. our mind and every and every convention we go to, it's like AI versus people. Like, can you make art uh -huh. or is like the machine going to do it for you? And it's like, right. no, we're still good. So it's like about the human spirit versus the machine coming in and, and industrialization and or technology. Oh, yeah. man. Right. Things so, are about to be super different and I don't like it. Not unless we use our ball sacks to uh, fight the say, resistance. Should I just pull my pull my ball? No, I'm <laughs> not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. Last point. Palm Poco, which is a, was a Studio yeah. Ghibli movie. Have you seen that movie? Oh, long time ago. It's one of the okay. weird ones that doesn't really get airtime or doesn't really. So, it's not directed by Miyazaki, but here's That's a screenshot right. from it. Oh, this now is you will understand what son, it is. Right? Oh, I don't Did remember who directed do it? it. And then it's his. <laughs> Oh, ball sacks. I'll read you the summary. A community of magical shape-shifting raccoon dogs struggled to prevent their forest home from being destroyed oh. by urban development. Uh, and a lot of places that I was reading about it, they reference it as sort of a modern example of the Tanuki. And, and so maybe that's one thing that we can watch one day on this imaginary uh, watch party that we're never going to do. But never. We keep saying we're going to do it. But yeah. I would love to watch this movie. I think it's I'm really exciting to see it. full of empty promises, you guys. I don't know if you guys know this. I think you all do, but... Anyways, though, but uh, a huge thank you to Karen from Renton, Washington, yeah. who at the the end of her email wrote, uh, they wrote to they wrote a PS and they wrote PPS. My girlfriend has rolled her eyes so many times at me during the time I've been writing this email on the clock <laughs> too, as my own small mischievous act. So she's keeping the spirit of sticking it to the man alive, and mm -hmm. for that we salute you, Karen. Thank you. I love these raccoon dogs. They are a symbol of resistance. They are mm -hmm. a symbol of. They are anarchists. <laughs> I love them. I know. I love them, too. There are so many more pictures I was going to send you, but then eventually this podcast would just be, if someone's listening to it, they're like, I. it's just listening to Hannah laugh at pictures that I can't see. <laughs> but for the video people... <laughs> Maybe we should just do like a cool <laughs> a cool slideshow at the end of the episode with just balls yeah. nonstop. Just balls on balls on balls. I'm just going to send you this one last one. Okay. <laughs> I look. And I you, want as many as you have, but I know you know, there, I, there I are a it. lot. But this <laughs> is the last one. This is the one from the Edo period, and it's just them oh, like at the gym. They're like weightlifting their. <laughs> it's like it's leg day with balls. It's leg day. <laughs> <laughs> they're weightlifting their own balls. 
Okay, Alain, I'm sorry. Just one more, one more, one more. Yeah, this yeah, yeah, this yeah. is the last one. This is the last okay, one. Okay, what's going on right here? Okay. It's the shop okay. signs. They don't have shop signs, so then they're just standing they're above just the shop per- and their balls perching. are the signs. Yeah. They're <laughs> well, this is absurd. I <laughs> I think this is my favorite one that you've done. I think um, Don't thank me, thank Karen. I I know, but you delivered it. Thank yeah. you, Karen. Uh that was <laughs> <laughs> I, I had so much fun researching this this is so great and honestly that article is fantastic like it was such a great uh it just contextualized it so wonderfully and i i really appreciated it thanks karen yeah anyway so that thanks, takes us Gavin. to was where we need so to funny yeah yeah so i knew good. you i knew you were gonna love it i knew you were gonna I have loved a meltdown it. i loved it <laughs> Yeah, so, so let's count down or what noise Count down, yeah, use? what do we want to do? Do we want to hear, there's uh, no ball sack sign of something getting killed. I don't know, drilling a hole. A drill. I'll, a or drill. Just There's not a whole see. lot of like super death in this one could or like we, explosions. Could we mimic the sound of somebody picking up their giant ball sack and slapping it down onto something? Okay. Uh, you could probably temp in a sound of like dough hitting the table. Like dough, someone's making dough. a pizza. Yeah, yeah, you can substitute that like a Foley artist would. There it is. We're doing, Alyssa, we're doing that. Alyssa, best of luck. Yeah. Also, feel free to just not do that. And feel if she doesn't, that's okay. Yeah, feel free to quit. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to do any of this. <laughs> you want to count us down? Yeah. Ready? Yep. Three, two, one, close. Gunzo. Just smash that tab with my... <laughs> All right. Moving on uh, to listener right. emails. You're up yeah. first. So I wish I'd picked a different one. Uh, oh, no. Because this is written by a child. <laughs> oh, no. They're going to have to hear the whole ball sack episode. I'm sorry. Well, no. It's look, I know her mom. I've known her mom since I was uh, 13. This is from my best friend Sarah's daughter. I'm not going to say okay. her name because uh, she's a minor. I think she's a teenager at this point. I actually don't know. I remember when she was born, and the idea that she's writing me an email makes me feel sick. Uh, and she says... Because you feel old, not because you're grossed oh, out by yeah. this person I, writing I, an I email. Was, we should clarify. Dude, I love her, all right? We go way back. I just can't believe I'm this old now. So my friend's kids are writing me emails. So, dear Kava and Hannah, I'm the daughter of one of Hannah's childhood friends, Sarah. I've been very invested in this podcast and I love it a lot. <laughs> y'all made me y'all have made me open more tabs than I usually have. I am going to assume that this isn't the goal of the podcast. No, but I don't even know what it, the goal of this podcast is anymore no. to be honest with you. We it's don't just know what this to is. To have no. a good time. This is just us f- f- going wherever we want. Down yeah. whatever Anyway, she says, "I found out a few months ago that when something is strawberry flavored and you look on the back of the package or bottle, and it says natural flavor, that means it's made of a beaver's anal gland. What? (laughs) From the moon? (laughs) Moon beavers, dude. Moon beaver's anal gland? It's an actual beaver's anal gland. Tastes like strawberry. Artificial strawberry (laughs) flavoring. This This started as an inside family joke where if anybody had a strawberry flavored anything, we say it has beaver butt juice in it. (laughs) Uh, what the shit <laughs> people have been using this stuff for centuries going back to roman times when they used it as a form of abortion <laughs> oh beaver what, anal gland abortion i don't think I just, she's don't a kid anymore I, I i can't believe i'm having a moment uh it was very weird to learn about and has scarred me forever <laughs> fondly s Okay. Well, P.S. Keep it juicy. So, uh, next time you eat anything strawberry, just remember that you're eating a beaver's anal gland. Wow. What about the next time I'm eating something uh, beaver's anal gland flavored? Am I supposed they to use, assume that it came from a strawberry? They use real strawberries for that. Yeah. Uh, that sounds as good. Uh, thank you, S. That's amazing. I love it. Um, email number two <laughs> is You're Caitlin. Dude. Yeah, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> don't know okay. what to tell you. Uh, Email number two is Caitlin from San Diego. Caitlin writes, Hi, Hannah and Kava. I found my way here from Hannah's Instagram, and I'm loving the podcast. It makes me feel very seen, but in a good way, not in a I don't want to be perceived way. (laughs) I feel that, man. 
Oh, I love attention, but then when I get it, I'm like, don't look at me. Yeah, come to our panel in San Diego. Uh, moving on. My tab <laughs> is about mudskippers, which are tropical fish that live in mangrove forests. Oh. I use the term fish loosely here because mudskippers are amphibious and spend up to 90% of the time out of the water where they engage Ooh. in very unfish-like activities <laughs> like breathing air and walking. <laughs> What? Mudskippers okay. can breathe directly through the skin lining their mouths and throat, though they also sometimes store a bunch of water in their gill chambers and breathe that way. Kind of like dip oh. almost. Like they've got like yeah, they a little got bit of stores. sus in there or something. Yeah. Sick. <laughs> uh, they I... have elbows in their pectoral fins and they ah. use their elbows to hobble around like a person walking ah. with crutches. Add in a pair of pelvic fins and these fish can climb trees and scale rocks. Mudskippers oh. also have powerful tails, which they use to skip across the water surface to avoid actually getting into the water. They can also use their tails to jump up two feet. Mudskippers' <laughs> eyes protrude from the tops of their flat heads, and yes, they figured out how to blink. <laughs> so this is where you come in. When they are okay. not flagrantly disregarding everything that means to be a fish, mudskippers enjoy being buried huh? in the mangrove bog. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Because their burrows will be underwater during high tide and because the mud they made out is very low in oxygen, mudskippers embrace their prepper lifestyle. They dig burrows in a J shape so they can create an air pocket at the top of the J by bringing fresh air down to the burrow in their mouths when the tide is low. Best. Caitlin uh... from San Diego. Yes, I will be at Comic-Con. And yes, of course, <gasps> I will come say hi. Thanks, ben, Caitlin. I can't wait to see you. Uh, what was the term you used earlier for like the, the mud search people? That you were talking mud about? Mudlarker. Mud Mudlarkers. Yeah, this had, this episode has had some themes in it. It did. Unintentionally. So, you know where I've heard about mudskippers is from this kid's TV show that had a whole episode on it called Octonauts, I think. And the whole episode is about them climbing trees. And I remember like watching my kid watch it and be like, I don't... What the hell? I don't know how to process this. Are they like in between? Are they going to take over someday? I mean, it's fine if they do. They're like whales who are reversing oh, now. So now they're going yep. back out. They're like, we were whales. We were we were normal things. We were fish. Then we went on the land. Then we went back in the water. Now we're coming back out again. It's it's a yeah. cycle. It takes lots of time. Uh, I just remember Muddy Mudskipper from Ren and Stimpy, I believe. Yeah. Back in the day. I think he had a song. Uh, oh, it's that's been a old. I haven't heard it. It is very old. Like me. Oh, thanks, Caitlin. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at San Diego, uh, yeah. which in case we haven't already mentioned it 50 times in this episode and the previous ones, we will be in San Diego at San Diego Comic-Con in mm -hmm. Artist Alley, BB01 and 02 by the t-shirt of, or tower t-shirts. Tower Again, hopefully that'll be there. Otherwise, we've been lying to everybody all this time. Yeah. And then when they get there, they're going to be like, actually, Tower of T-shirts is on the opposite side of the convention floor. And we've like led them all astray. Well, there. here's the thing I will say. There are two towers of t-shirts, I realize. So... Oh, are there? Uh, yeah, I passed There's by the two other towers. one last year. I see what and you're saying. Like, yeah. Yeah, the Lord of the Rings, the beloved Lord of the Rings book. Yes, not the other two towers. Not the other ones. Yeah. So I got I got aggressive. Uh, but yeah, if you want to send us your own open tabs, you can email us at 500opentabs at gmail.com, the number 500. And did you want to do the voice memo? Sure. Yeah, yeah. We, we were thinking if you guys were going to try this, no one submitted anything yet, but... Uh, if, if you're inclined to send us a voice memo, like letting us know, it'd be fun to hear your voice and sort of give mm -hmm. us all the information. Uh, but again, remember, it's just a quick blurb, what you learned. Send us the link and let us know where you're from, and then <clears throat> we'll take it from there. Um, additionally, uh, Patreon. Patreon. Watch this on YouTube. Follow the Discord. Uh -huh. Do 500 Open Roads. Uh, what follow the link tree with? in our Instagram, and there's all these things are going to be there. And they're going to be in the episode notes, too. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, uh, real quick about about Comic Con. We're yes. gonna have uh, an exclusive thing. Oh yeah. That Surprise. hopefully w we uh, we still haven't finished it, but uh, at the time of the recording, but it should we'll be see. good. We'll yeah. see. We're gonna have a very ex like insane thing that we're gonna post it, pictures it, of. It, it, truly it's insane. Truly nuts. Like I don't know how we made this happen. <laughs> we made it with the help of our friends Joe and Alyssa, who we're going to give a shout out on this episode as well, because we have a wonderful team of fantastic people who are yeah. helping us out. Thank you, Joe and Alyssa. You guys rock. We're lucky. Uh, you truly yeah, keep are. It... Hashtag blessed. Oh, uh, buy my book. You know, hashtag buy my blessed. book first. Buy, no. buy his book first. Buy three no, of his just books. Buy four uh, of Hannah's. I only have one, but you could buy four of it. Uh, yeah, that's true. Pre-order my fight book. Fight them it against each other. October eighth. I'll find. 
if they can, and they will. Yeah. There's actually, it's funny you say that because there's a part in the book where I'm fighting a, a doppelganger version of myself, and I have me in a headlock. Awesome. Uh, anyway, so I kind of do fight this. So yeah, I go, Cat People by Hannah Hillam. It's on all the book places. And, wonderful. Yeah. I think that about wraps it up. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Hannah, for finishing up your story. That was a wonderful, wonderful Thank time. you for yours. It truly enlightened me. I'm not kidding. <laughs> anyway, everybody, keep it Josie, and we'll see you next week. Keep it Josie. Bye.